Hi everyone, here's a quick video on something that I've been asked to do and that is what is needed for getting started with planetary imaging and the run through my equipment. Um, if you're looking for some inspiration on what you may or may not need for the next planetary season, here are a few of my absolute necessities and a few things that I think are really nice to have. Since I've started doing planetary imaging, I've upgraded quite a few things, but the general assembly really hasn't changed. So here is everything I used to get the whole solar system. So starting with the obvious, you'll want some reach. Um, as you may have seen from my previous videos, this is a Celestron CPC. It's a nine and a quarter inch tube on a dual fork alt azimuth mount. Nine and a quarter inch is considered to be sort of on the lower end of medium home telescopes, believe it or not. Um, in my opinion, I think you'll want anything above five or six inches of aperture to not be disappointed because the planets are really, really tiny up there. The reason I went for this one is the dual fork setup. I like being able to lift the optical tube and mount as one unit onto the tripod rather than having to hold the tube while I'm tightening the dovetail because I have limited space here and every time I want to image I have to take everything outside and set it up from scratch and this one is pretty much the largest one that I can still lift. Space saving is another reason why I went for an SCT rather than a large Dobsonian tube. Don't get me wrong, I would love a 16-inch motorized Dobsonian because they're amazing for planetary, but I have absolutely nowhere to put it. <laughs> um, I knew that I had to get something like this, which is a catadioptric system. They fold the light path so the tube is shorter and it's just easier to carry and store for me. I did used to own the 127 SkyMax, the 5-inch Maxitov Cassegrain from Skywatcher, and it's still my personal top recommendation for getting started on a budget. But when it was time to upgrade, I decided to switch to an SCT rather than a larger Mac because they are brighter and faster. This is something like F10 native, whereas the larger Macs are F15 which then slows me down and it's not great while I'm trying to beat the awful English coastal seeing. <laughs> the downsides of an SCT are basically what I said about Max in comparison, and that is that they're not as fast and bright as Dobsonians. However, I traded that for space to store it in, basically. Collimation is really easy, but because they're a closed tube system, uh, they take a lot of time to cool down and they're very sensitive to temperature change and residual heat. So sometimes even when it's been out for a really long time, if the temperature drops, it doesn't cool quickly enough and then you can still see the heat plumes coming off the corrector plate. Uh, they do up quickly as well and they are the more expensive option. Saying that, I really, really enjoyed mine so far, and it's been great for planetary, lunar, and even ISS imaging. One thing I was asked before is whether or not to go for the edge version of these. Now, I haven't tried an edge myself, but I have friends who have. Um, they have an inbuilt corrector plate inside, but you're not looking for a flat field for planetary, so it just becomes an unnecessary layer of glass in your optical train. Um, if you're somewhere with really good conditions, that might not matter. But if you're somewhere suboptimal like me and you're looking to just do planetary, then it's probably best to go with a plain version of an SCT. Next thing you need is a camera. As opposed to cooled deep space cameras, planetary cameras are relatively cheap and they are optimized for planetary imaging. They have small chips, fast frame rates, small regions of interest, everything that you won't be getting with a DSLR or a deep space camera. So I highly recommend getting a dedicated planetary camera if you can. As to which one, that will depend on your particular setup. Um, I spoke a bit about how and why I chose mine in this video here. Now comes the Barlow. I've actually gone for Teleview PowerMate. This is two and a half times. Uh, they're not really Barlows, but they do the same job as Barlows, but better. <laughs> Anyway, the reason I went for this one is, like anything I've tried from Teleview, they're great optical quality, they're parfocal, but most importantly for me is that they're a little bit brighter than traditional Barlow's um, because I prioritize faster frame rate. So with something like this, which is already at F10, I appreciate a bit more brightness so I can use lower exposure. 
that's why if you're going for a traditional Barlow, I would just recommend getting something with a bit more quality if you can. As for what size Barlow or PowerMate, that depends on your telescope and camera setup. The standard formula is to multiply your camera pixel size by five, and that gets you the focal ratio that you want to aim for. So take your camera pixel size, for example, 2.9 microns, and you multiply that by five, it gets you to just about 15, which means that you want your Barlow to take you to f15. So for example, if you have a Dobsonian at f5, uh, you want to use something like a three times Barlow to get you to that f15. Now, some people are saying that this number should be a six or even a seven, because as we all know, things that are perfect mathematically don't always work out like that practically because of different conditions. If you go under, um, all it means is that on a really good night, you might not resolve that last little bit of extra detail. And if you go over like I do, it means that on a good night, you may get that little bit of extra detail. And on a not so good night, your image may end up looking soft. I'm personally OK with this <laughs> because, as I mentioned before, I would rather get something great once in a while because it's not like I get really good seeing around here very often anyway. Next is the ADC, or the Atmospheric Dispersion Corrector. Now, if you're only going to do lunar, or you plan on imaging planets only at their best and highest, then you might just get away without one of these. But if you want to image Mercury or Venus, which are low on the horizon, or you want to start imaging planets before they reach opposition, then you're going to want one of these. They really do correct some of the effects of atmosphere at lower altitudes. Um, in my experience, they don't fix 100% of the problem, but they make enough of a difference to warrant having it. And I'm a big believer in fixing all the issues before the imaging so that the stacking can go as smooth as possible. And the final thing from the necessities is to check your camera to see whether it has a UV and infrared cut filter already built in. Many of them don't, which means that you'll have to add it. If you don't, the colors will be weird and the image may not be as sharp. Um, if your camera already has one built in, then you don't need it. But I personally wouldn't get a camera that has a built-in filter because that limits your options. But yes, um, just make sure that a UV and infrared cut filter is included in your imaging tray one way or another. This is what I would say are the absolute necessities of a planetary setup. Of course, if you're doing lunar, you don't need a Barlow or an ADC, but for any better planetary imaging, I think this is what you would need. Now, over time, I've gotten some upgrades and little things here and there that aren't essential, but are really nice to have. So I'll show you what they are and what they do. One of the reasons that I said I wouldn't get a camera with a built-in UV and infrared cut filter is that then you can't use something like an infrared pass, which is sometimes really great to combat seeing and get that little bit of extra sharpness. They mess with colors, but if you're shooting something like Mercury or the Moon or even ISS, then maybe it doesn't matter if the color doesn't come through. This is Astronomic Pro Planet 642 infrared pass filter. I used it on the moon and the ISS um, when I didn't care that it was black and white. And what you can also do is use it on Neptune and Uranus and then fix your color in post-process because it's just one color blue. To really make the best of them, you can always go for something like a monoplanetary camera. This is a W0642 mono. Um, I don't use it with a full RGB filter set because, to be really honest, from where I am, it's just kind of not worth it. But I do use it for different bandpass filters like infrared pass and UV pass because in the next season I want to do more um, imaging of Venus in false color with some cloud structures and things like Jupiter with a methane filter. And it also works really well for ISS if you're okay with black and white. Speaking of filters, this is a few that I've amassed over time. So apart from the Astronomic Pro Planet 642 infrared pass, which is more of a near infrared pass, I got the ZW850. Um, I wanted to do Venus in UV, so I got the UV pass. This is Optolong Venus U. Now this particular one leaks and the transmission wasn't fantastic. Plus Optolong completely blanked me when I emailed them with these issues, so I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I did, however, pull the trigger on this Astromania 
specialized planetary imaging filter set, which sells on Amazon of all things. Um, it has UV filter, infrared filter, and methane filter for 80 pounds. This should not be 80 pounds. This is like the price you pay for one UV filter. So this autumn, I'll give it a try and see if it is indeed too good to be true. So remember how I said that these are quite susceptible to dew. If you have a Mac or an SCT, you might find that you need a dew shield or a heater a lot sooner than you would with a daub. I have a dew shield, but depending on where you are, you might find that it just delays the inevitable. So the best little upgrade I've done is this Celestron dew heater ring that heats directly to the glass, and it just goes on the outside of the corrector plate instead of the outer ring. The great plus is that it's just ready to go whenever you need it. Um, the downside is that it only works on Celestron SCTs, but it really is a great upgrade. Um, the nine and a quarter inch one costs something like 55 pounds, which is surprisingly reasonable. But then if you want the controller, it's 300 quid, 300 pounds just for the controller. So needless to say, I just plug it in and let it blast on default setting. I don't use any sort of electronic focuser and I focus by eye, but I've seen folks struggle with the focuser knob when you have to move it with your hands and then you get the shake. Before you spend money on an electronic focuser, just try this. Close peg onto the focuser knob and you get a small sturdy lever. It doesn't hurt to try and it might actually help you out. And lastly, planetary imaging works at really high writing speeds and takes up a lot of space. So what you're looking for in a laptop or PC is as much storage as you can get, uh, a good processor, and USB 3 ports at a minimum. I used to have a 15-inch Dell Inspiron and the housing fell apart before any of the hardware failed. So when it was time to swap it out and I couldn't use it anymore, I just went with another one and hopefully this one will be as bulletproof as the one I bought in 2015. Software-wise, there's a few workarounds, but most of the free and sort of tried and tested planetary software is for Windows. So having a Windows machine really makes life easier. I'm a Mac user myself by day, but then I decided to get a Windows machine just for astrophotography. Um, there's a variety of programs that you can use for stacking and processing, but if you're just starting out, I would recommend that you get the golden standards, your Sharp Cap or Fire Capture for capturing, um, Auto Stacker for stacking, and Registax for wavelets. If anything, it's because there are already so many tutorials out there for these. And then finally, you'll need some sort of um, standard editing program like Photoshop or GIMP, which is free. Right, so if you've just finished watching this and you're assembling your planetary gear, um, next up, I guess, would be the video in which I show how I set it all up and then the one where I show all of my imaging and processing. I made them in a bit of a weird order because I only really make videos when somebody asks me something specific or I have something to say, but that's basically my entire planetary imaging process. Um, I hope this is helpful and good luck with this season, folks.